Hello and welcome to the Equals Palace podcast. I'm Fossil Greenborough and today pod 40 I'll be looking over the international break where a host of 2018 World Cup qualifiers and friendlies took place across the globe. I'll be looking at all the Palace players who have represented their countries and I'll be discussing how they got on. Also I'll be discussing Wilfred Zaha's nation change from England to the Ivory Coast. So let's begin. Six Crystal Palace players were in action for their countries over the course of the international break as a host of 2018 World Cup qualifiers and friendlies took place across the globe. Despite James McCarthy's withdrawal from the Scotland squad due to injury, there was still plenty for Eagles fans to keep their eye on before Palace returned to league action against Chelsea at the start of April. Wilfred Zaha represented the Ivory Coast as they played Russia and Senegal. Under-17s player Nio Kirby played for England's under-17 side as they faced the Czech Republic, Slovenia and Bosnia. New signing Luka Milovic played for Serbia as they faced Georgia. Welsh duo Wayne Hennessy and Joe Ledley played against the Republic of Ireland and Benteke played for Belgium against Russia. An excellent solo effort from Wilfried Zaha late in the game sealed the win for the Ivory Coast as they completed a 2-0 victory against Russia. Jonathan Kodiak had opened the scoring in Russia as he beat off the challenge of his marker before taking a touch and then firing home into the corner of the net. The Ivorians were playing their first match since their early elimination at the African Cup of Nations in January, but their win was clinched in this game courtesy of a special effort from Zaha. With 20 minutes of the game remaining, he picked up the ball outside the box and dribbled past three defenders before finishing with his left foot to double the lead and seal the victory. It was his second goal in six appearances for his country and now the squad prepare for their next game against Senegal on Monday evening after a deserved victory against the nation who will be hosting the World Cup finals next year. A video of his goal is now available to watch on the channel. Check the link in the description below or click the i button. Luka Milorovic played the full 90 minutes on Friday evening as Serbia came from a goal behind to beat Georgia 3-1 to top the World Cup Group D qualifying table. The home side dominated the opening 45 minutes and it was no surprise that they were in front, but for a late penalty conceded would have seen them go into the break ahead. Nika Karankva made the most of a bad defensive back pass to put Georgia ahead on 6 minutes, but Dusan Tadic equalised courtesy of a penalty. Filip Costa had been adjudged to have been fouled for the clock spot kick to be awarded and both sides went into the break on level terms. In a poor opening period for Serbia, Milinovic set up a chance for Tadic just past the hour mark, but the midfielder put his chance over the bar. The second half was a different story though, as the visitors took control of the contest. On 53 minutes, Milinovic found Tadic in a good position, but he didn't trouble the goalkeeper as he put his effort wide of the target. Just past the hour mark, Aleksandr Mitrovic put the visitors ahead, and the crowd in the Boris Pancha Arena soon saw the points confirmed as Matty Granzo scored his first goal at international level to complete the comeback. So Milinovic and his teammates, with after five games in the qualifying campaign, went top of the group with 11 points to their name. Wayne Hennessy kept another clean sheet as he and Joe Ledley were part of the Wales team that recorded a fourth consecutive draw against second place Republic of Ireland in Group D. Chris Coleman's side finished the game with 10 men as Neil Taylor was sent off following a tackle that led to Seamus Coleman leaving the game on the stretcher. The game had few chances from either side with the best falling to the visitors but Gareth Bale wasn't able to convert those that came his way. Following the sending off, Coleman had to make a change and this saw Jay Richards come on at the expense of Joe Ledley with 18 minutes remaining. The Republic of Ireland had to settle for second place in the group, but they still have a home match to come against the group, new group leaders Serbia, while Wales need to start turning draws into victories if they are to be at the World Cup tournament. <music> 
Wolford Zaha started for the Ivory Coast against Senegal on Monday night. However, the game was abandoned in Paris with just two minutes to play, with the scores at 1-1. The Eagles winger, who scored a sensational solo goal against Russia earlier in the international break, played for the first 58 minutes of the friendly between the two sides. However, he was withdrawn with the scores goalless. Liverpool's Sergio Mane soon gave Senegal the lead as he converted from the penalty spot, before Kryat Goibai equalised just a few minutes later. Although the encounter will be remembered for all the wrong reasons following the unpleasant scenes at the end of the game. With just a couple of minutes to play, the players were sent to the changing rooms by the referee, after supporters were able to evade the ground stewards by climbing over the perimeter fencing and actively confronting the players, with one fan even rugby tackling Senegal's Lyme Gassame. After a few minutes of being back in the changing rooms, the game was officially abandoned, meaning Zaha's 11th elephant cap will have to wait. Two first half goals from Christian Menteke came close to giving Belgium victory in the international match played at the Fish Olympic Stadium against Russia on Tuesday evening. Three minutes before half time the striker headed home when a corner wasn't cleared and then on the stroke of the interval Benteke got on the end of Nasser Chadli's free kick to put his home side in control before the late comeback off the home side. It was a foul on the Eagles forward that had given the visitors a penalty just past the quarter hour mark and Kevin Morales put Belgium in front from the spot after Victor Vassin had given the home side an early advantage. With 16 minutes remaining, Asak Magovic came off the bench to bring Russia back into the game, and in another substitute, Alexander Buffel levelled the scores in the second minute of added time. So now you've heard the match report, I'm now going to give you a little little small summary of the international break and I'm going to give you some positive and negatives. And the only real negative I can really find from the international break and that is the fact that James McArthur didn't feature. Now this was actually due to an injury. Now we don't know whether he did sustain it at Palace or whether during the international break because he didn't feature last week against West, uh, Watford which so we presumed he probably picked up a, uh, a knock in training but the fact that he was announced for the national team squad and then got taken out of it maybe you know we can assume that something happened in between that time maybe a double injury but something like that you know is a real disappointment because James McCarthy is a very crucial player for Scotland and obviously Scotland they're not a very good football team, but if they've got a, a player of McCarthy's ability who can score goals for them, it's vital that they have him in the team. And obviously they didn't because he had the injury. And obviously Scotland, I don't even think they won. I think they went on to either draw or, draw or lose the game. But certainly that was only the real negative from the game really. The fact that he didn't really feature because obviously we want to see how our other players get on. And you know it's not good when they get injured, but hopefully this was he was only a, it was only a precaution that he didn't go out on international duty, and hopefully he maybe be in the team for Chelsea. But the system we play at the minute, he's probably going to be on the bench, but that's fine because he's actually a pretty decent you know impact sub. But other than that sort of negative about McCarthy not featuring, I've personally listed a few positives that, in my opinion, I think we can take uh, from. You know, the international break, the first one being that all of the Palace players featured at least once. So all the national teams had one or more games and all of the Palace players at least played in one of them games. So some of the other positives, other than the fact that the players actually played, there's no injuries we know of. So the likes of Wayne Hennessy, Joe Ledley, Luka Milinovic, Benteke, Zaha, none of these guys, as far as we know, got injuries. So we've got our crucial players who played well for their countries. We've got them fully fit, as we know, to play against Chelsea. So hopefully... That would be good for us. Obviously, Wayne Hennessy and Joe Ledley, obviously, they were injury-free, but they both kept clean sheets for Wales. So, obviously, Joe Ledley hasn't been in the squad recently, but that sort of confidence of keeping a clean sheet for Wales will certainly give him a boost to get back in the squad. Same with Wayne Hennessy. He's now kept four clean sheets in a row in both you know, club and international level. So, if he can use that confidence to carry on, it's a bonus for us because, you know, Wayne Hennessy... Although in the game against the Republic of Ireland he didn't have to do much, there are still a few makes, mistakes he made, but he still made saves when he had to do that. Obviously, same with Luka. Luka, you know, didn't have a massive impact on the Serbian national team. Obviously, they did win their game 3-1, but Luka played really well for them, linking up well with some of the players. Um, uh, Tadic especially, you know, he was putting in lovely crosses for them. And if he can duplicate this for Palace, like he's been... 
um, like he's been doing for Serbia, you know, putting these crosses in, linking up with the attacking players. Certainly he can improve or he can even show us even more how crucial of an asset he is. Considering Serbia won the game is a credit to his defensive skills and the fact that he tried to set up chances by putting crossfield balls forward to the attacking players also just give us an idea of how well he played. You know, the, the fourth bullet point I'm going to talk to you about, you know, it was about Nio Kirby. So he's the uh, Palace's under-17s player and he got selected for England's uh, under 17s game and they played about three games winning all three of them so I don't know whether how crucial he was because the club haven't really released any match reports regarding the sort of youth uh, uh, international games but to be honest you know the fact that they won their three games I think and because he's a midfielder I think that's credit to him the fact that he was able to play for England and get uh, results with them but I personally think it's credit to him and the club the fact that the club have now got someone in the England national team following that all that palaver with Zaha about him not playing for England playing for England then he went to play for the Ivory Coast so it's nice that we've actually got uh, an English player in the English setup and hopefully if he can carry on you know improve and develop as a player with the help of the coaches at the club I don't see why maybe if he is playing well for the England under 17s why maybe he could have a chance if he breaks through and get into the first team but that's personally in my opinion a positive the fact that we've got an international player playing for England which is one of the the biggest um, international teams let's say in the world obviously the final bullet point really which I've sort of split up into doing that's both Benteke and Zaha both scored goals and when I say scored goals Benteke got two goals in one game and Zaha scored an absolutely sublime goal which if you do want to watch the the replay of that goal I have uploaded it to the channel which obviously I will leave a link to below in the description I would recommend you watch the goal because it was an absolutely fantastic goal for Wilfred Zaha. But starting off with Benteke, you know, I said he scored two goals for Belgium the other day against Russia. You know, Benteke came on the pitch, started this game. He didn't start the other game, but played this game. His goals came in the 43rd minute and the 45th minute. So he scored two goals in two minutes. Both of them were headers. Both of them were very good headers. One of the, the first goal, a ball got delivered into the box, deflected off the defender who was defending on the line. Benteke was there to head in the rebound. So an easy goal from him, but he had to stay composed to obviously get it in. And the second goal, lovely uh, free kick from Nasser Chadli into the area, right to the head of Benteke. Benteke, like he always does with his sort of set-piece presence, headed it right across the goalkeeper into the bottom corner. So once again, two fantastic goals from Benteke. And considering these are his first goals in about... Uh, about I think it's maybe 13 international and obviously club games is going to give him a real confidence boost the fact that he scored his first or he scored his two goals for the first time in about yeah about maybe about two months so about 13 weeks so the fact that he's got that now he hope it will give him a little bit more confidence so when we go to the game against Chelsea he can maybe when he gets the chances to score goals he can take them better than he did against Watford where because of his lack of confidence he didn't know whether to shoot pass and obviously ultimately he missed out on them chances but certainly I personally think two goals from Benteke absolutely fantastic for his confidence and hopefully he can score a few more for us uh, as the season nears its end and to be honest, I must say that Benteke, he's played in his last two games for Belgium. He scored five goals, which is showing what an asset he is to the Belgium national, national side. The fact that he scored that many goals. And obviously the final thing really, I said both Benteke and Zaha scored a goal. Zaha's goal, absolutely fantastic solo effort. You know, picked up the ball on the edge of the area, dribbled past three or four defenders. Lovely, I think, yeah, he's right footed. So weak footed shot with his left foot over the goalkeeper into the top bins of the goal fantastic goal there you know the fact that he was able to dribble past the players the fact that he was on his own he didn't need to go and do any one two passes and the fact that he used his weak foot to chip it over the keeper into the goal absolutely sublime goal and you know I personally think he is he's been no doubt about it our best player this season but if he can score continue scoring goals give an assist like he's been doing for the Ivory Coast and what he done you know before he left to go on the international break if he can carry on this form you know He's going to be a real asset to us into stay, uh, in staying in the Premier League. But certainly, fantastic goal from Wolfie Zaha. There isn't really any words to describe it. But like I said at the beginning, if you do want to have a look at a replay of the goal, head over to the channel here. I'll leave a link in the description below. I would recommend you watch the goal because it's absolutely fantastic skill 
and class from uh, Zaha. But to be honest, these were all the positives I really took from the game. The fact that there were no injuries, Wayne Hennessy Ledley keeping clean sheets, Luca playing really well offensively and defensively for Serbia. The fact that we've now got an English player in the sort of uh, or we've got an English player playing for the England youth setup, and the fact that both Zaha and Benteke both scored goals, Benteke scoring two, and obviously Zaha scoring the fantastic goal. But do comment below with anything else you think we can take from the break, you know, and also what you thought of both of Benteke's and Zaha's goal. You know, give me a word to describe Zaha's goal, and do give me the opinion. Uh, or do write about whether you think that the fact that Benteke scored, that's really going to boost his confidence. But the final thing really I wanted to talk about, and that is actually a story uh, that came out um, during the international break. And that was actually an interview with the England manager, Gareth Southgate. And I'm going to quote most of this, I'm going to quote from the article. Um, but he said that he wanted Wilfred Zaha for the England role, but he was too late. And obviously, this interview, I found it in the Guardian newspaper, but it's being replicated in all different news outlets now. But the Guardian were the main people to interview Gareth Southgate. But to be quite honest, in my opinion, these quotes uh, from Southgate on Wilfred Zaha are pretty pathetic. And I'll go on to tell you why. Because, you know, he's saying that, you know, we should have picked Wilfred Zaha for England, but we were too late. But given the fact that he had waited four years for a call-up, is it really surprising that you were too late considering he had had enough of waiting four years so he left so I'm, I'm going to go on to talk about that more but just to read uh, one of the quotes uh, from the news article and it says that Gareth Southgate has revealed that he made a late attempt to persuade Wilfred Zaha against choosing the Ivory Coast before England but he said he did not pick anyone unless they had the inherent desire so the first thing really to talk about this quote you know He's saying that Zaha doesn't have any inherent desire. Now, I can certainly tell you from the way that Zaha celebrates goals that he definitely has desire. And the fact that he's, you know, he quit the Ivory Coast to play for England and tried to get in the England squad, the fact that he waited uh, four years shows that he has the desire to get into the England squad. And the fact that he kept improving week in, week out, and the fact that he still didn't get picked, I'm not surprised that he went to go to and choose the Ivory Coast rather than England. And, you know, the fact is, you know, Townsend, yes, Townsend's a very good player, but he got picked over Zaha so many international breaks. There was twice in particular, even though that Townsend didn't have any form and the fact that he wasn't starting. And I think, in my opinion, yes, Townsend, a good player, and it's good to see him playing for England, but Zaha was in so many, it was in such brilliant form. He had six assists at that point. He had about four goals. So if he was right in form. Townsend didn't have form, but yet you picked, Gareth Southgate picked Townsend over Zaha purely because in my opinion that Townsend had played for England before but, but based on form and based on the fact that Zaha was actually starting games unlike Townsend he should have been in the squad in that instance and to be honest the final thing really is you know he said that he didn't have the desire I'm not surprised he didn't have the, have the desire and I say that in, in inverted uh, brackets or was it in brackets in, in quotation marks because really he did try to keep getting into the squad. You know, we talked about it. He he waited four years to get a call up. He kept trying to get into the uh, get into the squad, but he had enough of not being appreciated by England. And obviously, that's why he changed com uh, countries because he knew that the people of the Ivory Coast would appreciate his ability. And obviously, hence why he moved. The fact that he, you know, England or certainly English Palace fans knew the ability he's got and wanted him to play for England, having seen how bad they've been recently. But the FA and Gareth Southgate decided that he isn't really good enough, apparently, and he hasn't got the desire to play for them, even though he's waited four years. And obviously, Zaha's, you know, I personally think he's taken a very mature decision and gone to a gone to a country where he'll be appreciated and actually where he'll probably win things. Now, he also said that Zaha uh, switching countries was actually his main priority when he took the manager's job full time, and that was at the end of November. But he didn't disu um so yeah, he didn't uh, decide a player who had already won a senior cap uh, with England during Roy Hodgson's time in charge. And he said that I didn't really appreciate that there was a disappearing egg time on him going to the Ivory Coast. He was the first player I met with when I got the job permanently, but he had already made his mind up. So obviously, just talking about there, the quotes from Southgate, you know, saying that when he became the England manager full-time, that was his main priority to get, you know, the... Wilfred Zaha to play for England considering that during Roy Hodgson's era as the England manager he actually got uh, an England cap but you know apparently according to Southgate he didn't really appreciate the fact that there was disappearing time you know egg time on the fact that he was going to play for the Ivory Coast but I can really tell you you know 
Southgate obviously didn't try hard enough. And when you look at it, he said that there was a disappearing time. Up. Of course, time was running out because Zaha had had enough of waiting. But he had over two months to try and persuade Zaha or at least give him a chance in the England squad to stop him making that decision. You know, he obviously didn't try hard enough and I can't highlight it enough. And lots of people on social media have said that. And you may think, you know, I'm making this up, you know. On the 27th of September, you know, Gareth Southgate was appointed as the England manager. And the 27th of November, two months later, Zaha was confirmed in the Ivory Coast squad. And it was confirmed that he had switched from England to the Ivory Coast. So Gareth Southgate had exactly, or thereabouts, two months to try and persuade Zaha. But the fact that he said he wasn't happy with the time running out, you know, he had two months. You could easily put him in the squad for a friendly during that time. But, you know, Southgate chose not to do that and then came out in this interview saying that. And I just think it's, I think it's really wrong, the fact that he said that. Because he had the choice, he had the decision to pick him. But now he's saying that because, you know, time was running out, he just didn't want to pick him and he didn't appreciate that you know Zaha had enough so he gave them a little bit of time and then once the time was up he left now obviously Southgate has said that you know he wanted to keep Zaha on there you know this this is actually a quote from uh, from his interview and he said we would like Zaha to choose us but there was nothing we could do well to be honest there is something that Gareth Southgate could have done and that could that is actually you could have actually picked him and it's quite simple you know, you would have liked Zaha to choose you, you know, you would have liked Zaha to play for England, but you didn't pick him, which meant that he was tired of waiting to get his chance, so he left to go to the Ivory Coast. So it's quite simple, uh, Gareth, if you wanted him to play for him, maybe you should have picked him for the squad in the first place. And obviously, all tying in with this, there was a few articles as well about some comments made by Danny Mills. Now his comments um, were saying that Zaha's choice to play for the Ivory Coast rather than England was a cop-out and the easier option. Now in my opinion, and I've seen a lot of re angry reaction to this on social media, but these comments really are completely wrong and disgraceful in my opinion because he's took to national radio to have a dig at a footballer for representing their country of birth. So basically Danny Mills is saying that he took the easier option to go to play for the Ivory Coast because they get played every game rather than waiting to play for England because you know England are apparently a better a better national side but to be honest I think it's completely wrong he said that because he's saying that Zaha should wait to get a chance for to play for England but he's not allowed to go and actually play for the country where he was born and bearing in mind that Zaha uh, lived in the Ivory Coast until the age of about four you know i think he definitely has the right to go there and the fact that danny mills has said that on national radio as well we must reckon uh realize he's had a dig at him saying you know you're not allowed to play for your country of birth you should be waiting to get your chance for england i think that's quite disgraceful saying that you're not allowed to play for your country of birth purely because it's seen as a easier option and i'm sure the likes of you know, Ryan Giggs, the, he he trained with the England young, uh, younger side, but he chose to play for Wales. I never see him complaining about that, saying that, uh, that sorry, that saying that Ryan Giggs took the easier option because he was never going to get played for England. But seriously, you know, I think it's disgraceful the fact that he said that Zaha shouldn't be able to play for his birth country because he should wait for the England chance. Which, bear in mind, considering Gareth Southgate's comments about not having passion, he probably wasn't going to get a chance in the England squad anytime soon soon but obviously do comment below with what you think about obviously Zaha's international state status what you think about the comments made by Danny Mills and obviously Gareth Southgate yourself and whether you do think the comments are wrong because I certainly think they're wrong the fact that they're saying that he doesn't have commitment he doesn't have the passion you know it's wrong that he made this, this decision I think that's completely wrong these comments but do comment below with what you think but in summary really I'm just going to summarise what I think of this whole sort of situation with Zaha's international status. I think he waited long enough to get his chance. He hasn't got his chance. So when, you know, so he joined a better national team. And to be quite honest, he's probably going to actually win tournaments uh, with the Ivory Coast. And considering I'm English, if we do end up England playing against the Ivory Coast in the World Cup, if England get knocked out from a Zaha goal or a Zaha assist, I won't be too disappointed because it just shows the England uh, team, the FA, Gareth Southgate, and all of these people have criticised him over the years, what quality he's got. So I am saying this here, I seriously, if England get knocked out of the World Cup, because of the Ivory Coast, because of Zaha's goal or assist, if that does actually happen, I won't be too disappointed as an Englishman because it would just show, you know, what a mistake England have made.
So there you have it. Now you've heard my match reports and my opinion. That concludes this week's podcast about the international break. But make sure to come back next week for my post-match review of the game against Chelsea. So thanks for listening and remember to up the palace.